Afternoon all, let's have a look at another interesting Magnus Carlsen game this afternoon. This is against John Smeets, a Grandmaster 2550 at the time. It was played in the Chorus Group B tournament, January 2006. Magnus Carlsen playing black, John Smeets played E4, and we saw Sicilian defence. And Magnus employed the Sicilian Sveshnikov variation. So after knight f6 here, knight c3, e5, knight db5, and white's plan is usually revolving around this d5 square, this structural concession black has made. But black gains a little bit of time, and in some variations gains the bishop pair. We see d6, bishop g5, all theory, pinning that knight, a6, knight a3, and you might think this is quite odd, for this knight to end up on a3. It's all part of the plan to make use of d5 and reinforce the d5 control with a move like this later, knight c2, then either knight e3, or as in this game later, we'll see knight b4. So d5 is the sensitive part of black's position. b5 immediately threatens to fork both knights. So knight d5, this is all theory, bishop e7, and in this position, bishop takes f6 is played. Bishop takes f6, c3. So the knight prepares to use either this route or this route. Bishop g5, knight c2. Now knight e7, usually in fact this route is not available because this knight has gone to e7 to challenge the knight on d5. Knight b4 seems in this position a more effective route to reinforce the d5 knight. Because if knight e3 here, perhaps black has a viable option of just taking on e3. There's of this battle for the d5 square to undermine the supporter of d5 by taking, and then maybe following up with either bishop e6 or bishop b7 would help black's game potentially. So in this position, after knight e7, knight cb4 is used. There's not really time for black to play a5, because knight takes e7, for example, and then knight d5 is dangerous, or a takes, then there's knight c6, and then knight takes b4. I don't think a5 is playable, but we'll look in the second pass at this position. So this is slightly different from knight coming to e3, which is the more usual path, but it's made possible because Mangus immediately contested d5 with his knight retreat. Okay, in this position, black castled. And now white left the bishop on f1 and just proceeded to undermine black's queen side with a4, which is a very often used thematic move. Black's pawns here are often vulnerable in the Sicilian Sveshnikov. And now after b takes a4, clearly this pawn is a target on that a file. Rook takes a4, and that pawn is also um, now after a5, not really threatening a b because of the pin, clearly. And not only that, white often has neat little moves like queen a1 in this type of position. For the moment, white plays knight takes e7, and after queen takes e7, actually leaves the knight on b4 here, plays bishop c4, just reinforcing light square control. Bishop d7 hitting the rook, and now we see knight d5 hitting the queen, and it will be checked, so there's no time for bishop takes a4, because that will be checked. The queen moves back, and curiously, okay, you might think, well, knight c7, is a little bit of a target uh, once the rook moves, okay, but um, for the moment knight c7 is completely answerable I think, where bishop takes a4, so the rook goes back and now Magnus protects c7 with bishop d8. Okay, white castles, and now we see rook c8, bishop goes back to b3 here, an alternative b3 might be undeminable with the move a4, which Magnus is clearly supporting with this battery here. So bishop b3, rook b8 is played, and this is an interesting position from the point of view of the Sicilian Sveshnikov player. 
one of the things which certainly put me off a little bit in the past version of games was white's knight on d5 always a dominant looking aggressive knight but if black can live with that knight and get used to it and and just get the benefits that that in, are incurred from white having that knight you know like the bishop pair these benefits can pay great dividends so in this position queen c2 and now king h8 clearly preparing one benefit of the position is f5 to be able to try and undermine and use the f file this semi open f file is an important source of tactical opportunities okay rook f a1 so it looks as though a5 might be a target at some point but the other reason for this move maybe more importantly is to get rid of black's light square bishop with bishop a4 so f5 and in fact bishop a4 is played here bishop takes a4 and now the option of course rook takes a4 is an interesting alternative to queen takes queen is left to support e4 now the rook is also supporting e4 as well f takes e4 is played now we see a curious move in this position rook 4 to a2 will really have to check this out in the second pass of the game why did white want to do that well actually coming to think about it queen takes e a e4 is not possible here because the rook takes b2 okay that looks as though that that would be very good for black but what about rook takes e4 <clears throat> in this position it would seem that black has moves like queen f7 or queen g6 which could be annoying but let's really check that out in the second pass white doesn't mind black temporarily being a pawn up here it's only double pawn after all okay and by protecting b2 he's giving himself now clearly the option of queen takes e4 without losing b2 but it's black's move can magnus seize this opportunity for this delayed pawn recapture it seems a little bit cheeky on the cheeky side to be protecting b2 to be able to take with the queen so the question was was rook takes e4 actually impossible so Magnus doesn't give time now for queen e4 because he plays queen f7 so he's double attacking d5 and f2 so d5 is now loose that has to be sorted out white chooses c4 and again okay white's plan is eventually to take this pawn and with the rook on a2 actually white might be considering at some point b3 and queen takes e4 if b3 wasn't subject of target practice here but um okay what else is there uh, holding up queen takes e4 maybe white can also consider rook f1 and then try and take on e4 but uh, it's Magnus's move and he plays quite an interesting move here stopping white from even playing technically b3 he plays actually the move rook b3 so if the queen takes the rook here and then queen takes f2 it's actually mating after the king moves queen f1 so all of a sudden this is getting a little bit uh, worrying for white perhaps this pawn which wasn't collected immediately it's still there so rook e1 okay and Magnus's move again he uses it to induce a threat and a weakness bishop h4 attacking f2 now a weakness is created with g3 and the bishop being attacked is just ignored now can you spot what white um sees magnus play now what does magnus play in this position 
if I give you 10 seconds starting from now. Okay, make this plays rook f3, just ignoring the threat. He's going to crash down with rook takes f2 and queen f3, potentially. White reinforces f2 now with b3. So this rook is joining in the defense. And now we see bishop d8. Okay, can white finally get back his pawn without too much problem? Well, he does take the pawn now, finally. Okay, and we're left with that Svechnikov scenario, which maybe many Svechnikov players are a bit worried about. Potentially superior knights for the bishop situation. But it's black's player's job to drum up counterplay on the king side, and he does so, Magnus does so with h5. And the bishop is not a bad dark square bishop in the, in that it does support h4. It is protecting the h4 square. So white kind of resigns himself to having h4 being played. He plays rook e2, just reinforcing his position a little bit. h4. And now we see rook b2, which frees up the queen to move away from this pawn if needed. G6 is played. So this gives black maybe some extra options like queen f5 potentially. King g2. And also, of course, the use of the h7 square might be useful, the h file generally, to switch some resources there. But for the moment, Magnus plays hg. And after hg, a shocker is played in this position. I wonder if you can spot it if I give you 10 seconds starting from now. Okay, black plays rook takes g3, believe it or not. We'll need to really check this out in the second pass. What's going on here? Is this really dangerous for white? Well, maybe with Magnus's g6, a rook can swing across like this. So, for example, takes, check, and now maybe rook f7 is dangerous. Is threatening rook h7, but we'll check this out in the second pass. Alternatively, maybe even the nifty king g7 for just rook h8 as well. That might be the more effective use of the h file here. So that g6 is actually a very attacking move, as it turned out, when Magnus played g6. So he's supporting this tactical idea. This f file is maximized with the use of g6. So king f1. Now we really see like the tau side of Magnus in this game. He's you know obviously he's played a dynamic, very dynamic openings structurally on the dodgy side with white having a seemingly mighty knight on d5. But it's black's dynamic counterplay which he must play on. And he does. Queen f3 threatening immediately queen h1 mate that's parried with queen e4 which looks like a clever defense queen h5 is played which keeps threats like queen h3 going as well as other ideas knight e3 is played and then we see bishop g5 and that bishop is very nice now on this diagonal and knight coming off, the proud knight coming off to d3, for, from d5 to e3 for defensive duties, doesn't seem like white's having a good time anymore. King e1. And then we see rook g f3. Knight stumbles back really defensively, knight f1. Now Magnus uses a forcing move, bishop c1, taking the rook, rook a2. 
Now, that's very interesting because that leaves actually that B3 undefended. So we really need to check if Rook B1 was impossible. In this position, Magnus does go for the B3 pawn. Rook takes B3. And you might consider, well, hold on, Rook A5, but then, for example, Rook B1 could be dangerous at the moment the Queen's holding that, but is there something else? Does it look too dangerous to take on A5? We'll have to investigate that in the second pass. This is a really technically interesting position. Knight G3 is played. And in this position, it looks as though uh, White's King is in real trouble. But with the White Queen supporting H1, it's tempting to try and sacrifice here. But no, Magnus resists the temptation for the moment. He plays Queen H6. That Queen is on H1. But now, Queen G4 changes the situation dramatically. The weakness of the last move. White's energy is being used in some clever way here, obviously, but the energy has dropped from protecting h1. So guess what Magnus plays now with crushing effect? If I give you 10 seconds starting from now. Okay. Rook takes g3, of course, making use of that weakness of the last move to maximize the impact of rook takes g3 now. And here, white resigned. If he plays, well, let's turn on our engine assistant here. It's actually a forced mate. If queen takes g3, check. This is the clearest, obviously. So now we need to check out um, that we make there. If F takes G3, it's mating one. That's fair enough. So otherwise, White's lost material then. So Rook G3 is a real crusher. It's actually a forced mate after Rook takes G3. In this position, uh, well, we'll get back to that later. Let's go from the start. So Sicilian Sveshnikov. Maybe an inspiring game for budding Sicilian Sveshnikov players that Magnus Colson played it with such great effect here, it seems. So c3, bishop g5, knight c2, knight e7. So let's answer this question about knight c e3 from an engine point of view. Would it have been okay to let black potentially play bishop takes e3, or is that even? The issue here. Engine doesn't really like bishop takes e3. Knight takes. White's okay. Another interesting idea is h4, which I have seen in some Svenstikov games. Just using that bishop as a tempo gain there. But um, okay, technically it's not that amazing for white. So what he played was knight c b4, which seems okay. It's logical, con keeping control of d5. After castles, he plays a4. Again, logical, trying to smash up black's pawn structure on the queen side. b takes, rook takes was played. Now also, queen takes a4 is liked by the engine here as a potential improvement on brief analysis. If we have this position with bishop d7, Queen a5, yes, white could just play on a6 potentially. So like this, that looks pleasant enough. Different from the game, a different game entirely. Okay, but anyway, rook takes a4 was used. And we saw a5. Another interesting move um, coming up after knight takes e7. Not moving knight, but instead moving the bishop. Was there a reason for this? What about knight d5 immediately? Is that too simple? Maybe the engine actually doesn't like knight d5 immediately, believe it or not. 
these grandmasters do see a lot of resources in the position but it seems here that queen b7 technically gives black an advantage why well here okay let's try and defend with rook a2 f5 it looks as though black's having a fun game in fact in this position with pressure on d5 and b2 something's gone wrong slightly with white set up here so this move bishop c4 is actually really liked okay instead as an alternative the knight doesn't have to move here that pawn is pinned to the rook so we see bishop d7 and now knight d5 queen e8 okay and the rook goes back now to a2 still fine for white control of d5 it's what the white player wants bishop d8 is played which actually increases white's advantage slightly engine recommends rook b8 say castles queen c8 still there's a grip which is unpleasant which version of players are used to but it's still unpleasant so in the game actually bishop d8 though after castles rook c8 now here there's a question raised earlier about b3 is a4 very effective well yes a4 might be the move but it still might be okay for white of the queen d3 a takes bishop takes bishop b5 forcing c4 is that a big deal i think white's okay here it's got a nice enough position so in the game actually we saw bishop b3 which looks like a good idea as well strategically to try and get rid of the light square bishop to reinforce this knight forever on d5 seems like an attractive proposition rook b8 here so immediately uh discouraging bishop a4 because white would lose the b2 pawn here if bishop a4 i think black can just take on a4 end up winning b2 so that has to be prepared so the strategic exchange is not working here but uh that's why i guess that um queen c2 is making way for rook a4 and a slow bishop a4 to achieve this strategic exchange of light square bishops to reinforce the knight on d5 without any challenger king h8 so rook f a1 seems part of the plan but in some technical way an inaccuracy from an engine point of view let's go back here knight e3 has a benefit here of maybe holding up f5 if f5 here can might just take yes because the knight and queen are on f5 Queen h5 trying to regain the pawn, bishop e6. This could get unpleasant. So that's interesting that knight e3 might technically be better. If black's counterplay generation revolves around f5, maybe this plan could have been delayed. But um, we see both plans in action now f5 generating some tactical counterplay on the f file. And then it is logical, that's where the rooks just left f2 as well. So bishop a4 is now played, but now actually the engine likes black in this position. The balance seems to have been swung, even though intuitively this is a strategically important exchange for white to get rid of the light square bishops and keep that monster knight on d5. But it seems black has dynamic compensation. Now here the move queen takes a4 again still loses a pawn black just takes and then takes on b2 so rook takes a4 is necessary and we see f takes e4 and now the mystery of why white couldn't have taken rook takes e4 needs to be explored queen e4 clearly rook takes b2 but rook takes e4 could that have been used ah and here is why everyone on YouTube here is why the engine illustrates that there's a very very powerful resource in this position using the loose knight now on d5 
So this counterplay generation wasn't just about the f fold dynamics, it was about making the knight on d5 loose with f takes e4. That knight is a slightly looser piece than before and is tapped into with queen b5 in this variation. So queen b5. If we can play it. And black is hitting b2 and the d5 knight. Uh, let's try and avoid that certain depth. Queen b5. So, okay. So, what would white actually be doing here after queen b5? He's losing material. It's, it's it's a really important double attack resource. Queen Queen D one. This doesn't look as though there's too much compensation. Uh, okay, so that's what White wanted to avoid. So clearly, uh, he's aware of that, perhaps. So he wants to take on e4. So his first step is to avoid losing b2. So he plays rook four to a2. <laughs> It seems this monster knight isn't all that it's been cracked up to be. It's actually a loose piece from a different perspective. And uh, now white is struggling to regain that pawn. So queen f7, again stopping white regaining the pawn, because he'll get mated here clearly. Queen takes e4, queen takes f2, and he'll get mated on the back row. So he can't take that pawn just yet. So he plays c4. Okay, that reinforces the knight. And potentially gives white um, a chance. Maybe b3 is just too slow with the idea of protecting the pawn. Maybe the way to wrap up this pawn is just frontally with rook e1. That's basically what he chose here. But c4 is a general, uh, is a good move to reinforce the d5 knight again. So rook b3 though interrupts white's plans a little bit. More than a little bit. Because how on earth does black actually use that f file pressure if he didn't have the p3 resource? This is absolute genius. Sveshnikov players worldwide must be looking for ways in this position with the bad bishop to get more pressure on that f file. If the f file dynamic is being relied on here to counterbalance white's huge knights, this kind of resource is really, really relevant. It's switched in the game that rook to the king side to join forces on the f-file. Rook b3, what an amazing resource. Simple, but very, very effective to intensify the f-file pressure. So we see now rook e1 and that dark square bishop causing a major, major weakness with bishop h4. How can white deal with this weakness in any other way apart from g3? It seems black's got the technical advantage here. The engine likes uh, black's position. So g3, and we see rook f3 just ignoring the bishop. If the bishop is taken here, I think that would just be crushing. It's a forced mate in seven. Rook takes f2. Forced mate. Check. Check. And that's pretty nasty. <laughs> well, we don't need to go too far here. Uh, so, can't take the bishop basically. So, in this position, white has to defend f2 again with b3. This is probably not what he imagined. Okay. And now, black has to step back from this. But he has achieved his goal. He's got this rook involved miraculously on the f file. So, the bishop steps black and finally allows white to recapture his pawn. Okay, but black still has the advantage here, it seems. At least a small, tiny advantage. We're talking less than half a pawn. h5 is played. So, a kingside attack. Rook e2, h4. Now, of course, sacrificial devices like rook g3 are emerging to try and use that f file. Rook b2 and the genius 
the genius of this little move now to make Rook G3 more effective with G6 is incredible. G6 just indicating basically not only of course Rook F7 to H7 but the easier King G7 for Rook H8 as a new resource potentially introduced in the position here. Who would have thought a move G6 is of some relevance? This mighty knight in inverted commas is, is is kicking empty squares. They're not really doing much, these squares, this monster knight on d5. It's visually impressive, but black is drumming up sufficient kingside attack, attacking chances. And white blunders here with king g2. Yes, it is a clear blunder to the engine that this is now minus three after the natural king g3, king, pardon me, king g2. We see the evaluation shift hugely in black's favour. Hg. White's position is desperate. It's it's lost. This is a lost evaluation if it's over this usually. Plays Hg, allowing the crushing rook takes g3. So let's see how these resources like king g7 are they indeed relevant? So f takes. Check. King h2, and yes, indeed, and I hadn't end in engine checked this game before, just assume this on the first pass, that this must be the sneakiness behind g6. It's the simple move here, king g7, just introducing rook h8. So tactically, Magnus has shown genius in getting both rooks involved on the f-file, with rook b3 gliding in with rook f3 from a weakness introduced from bishop h4 to induce g3 to use that f3 square. And further, the attack follow-up has been stunning with h4 and then this subtle g6, which even his grandmaster opponent just maybe didn't see what hit him until it's too late. This position will be absolutely critical. What can white do here? Defenseless, it's actually a mate in seven, this position. So let's go back. So in the game, white's been completely damaged his king safety his, the the knight having to retreat back to try and defend very shortly best to keep the queens on as a general principle when you've got the attack i think taking on e4 would actually throw everything away mostly small advantage nothing keep the queens on frets on White's only defending by the skin of his teeth, h1 anyway. Knight e3. We see bishop g5 in this position, which might not be the most accurate actually. More accurate move, queen h3. Apparently, king e1. Ah, oh, the engine loves these positions though. Rook takes f2. What is going on here? Well, clearly, if rook takes f2, rook takes e3 is crushing. So forget that. King takes f2. Bishop h4 is apparently absolutely crushing. So if king tries to run here, rook takes e3 and taking the queen. What else can white do in this position? After bishop h4. It looks pretty bad. So maybe Magnus missed a tactical trick here actually so he could have blasted white with check um, and then the crushing rook takes f2 instead he plays bishop g5 he hasn't lost his attack but uh, white plays now the engine kind of recommended move king e1 trying to get the king to safety rook g f3 and then knight f1 going into a real defensive mode. The knight swallowing its pride, coming back all the way to f1. So we see bishop c1 attacking the rook. Second question, well, or rather, another question here. <laughs> Could white just keep the fence of b3 here with rook b1? Okay. Now the engine likes bishop a3, which would give bishop b4 check as a resource. That's pretty impressive, actually. Bishop a3, nifty move. And maybe that's what white saw, actually. 
uh, why he didn't play rook b1 possibly because bishop a3 looks pretty bad for the bishop on b4 so knight kicks the queen here there's tactics like this this has gone crazy this position if it takes here there's queen c1 there's another idea behind the bishop on a3 to support queen c1 wow so okay okay so the rook uh, wanted to stop bishop a3 it seems giving up b3 or maybe it's time pressure mind you it's just after move 40 now so you'd assume they've both got extra time but uh, Magnus advantage is clear here knight g3 now we see in this position queen h6 technically maybe better queen h2 Uh, for particular tactical reasons maybe g3 is under greater fire here something knight f1 queen g1 it looks nasty okay but uh, okay in Magnus's continuation okay after queen h6 white made a terrible final howler creating a weakness of the last move Best best chance apparently King D one, but his his material down now. It's really come coming academic if this attack um, needs to have an immediate knockout blow. If King D one, I mean he's two pawns up, so Black can just afford to give up A five for example, Bishop A three, and and just coordinate the attack. Just rages on here, so it doesn't really matter now. So he in the lost position basically he he accelerates his demise. He plays queen g4, allowing the crushing forced mate, it seems, <laughs> with rook takes g3. Okay. So this is quite, for me, an astonishing demonstration that Magnus's resourcefulness in tactical positions, and even from structurally seemingly suspect positions, he's able to generate huge dynamic counterplay. And and really play like Tau if needed. This is Magnus's Mikhail Tau hat style being demonstrated in this game. I hope you enjoyed it. Comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.